In today's video, join us on a captivating journey behind the scenes of the movie, The Beekeeper, where the creative process comes to life. Discover the secrets, challenges, and extraordinary moments that make this film an unforgettable cinematic experience. Catch some exclusive set interviews with the brilliant minds shaping every frame in the making of The Beekeeper. Then you will lose all your data since they'll have to replace the hard drive. What? This is a guy new. Agent Parker? Yes. I'm so very sorry about your mother. But rest assured, her passing will not be in vain. You know, I've got an old friend, uh, Kurt Wimmer, who's a writer that uh, I've had many sort of uh, connections with over the years. Scripts that we nearly did, scripts that we didn't do. We haven't sort of done anything, and it was, you know, it was an opportune moment where we connected, and he passed me something, he slipped it to me. He'd just written it in the, in the in the pandemic, uh, and literally, uh, literally, it was a page turner for me. And uh, I was so excited. I said, we just got to do this uh, and we'll team up and we'll, we'll make this happen very quickly. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the sort of gods aligned. We, uh, we got David to come on board and Chris Long and Cedar Park. Uh, and it became something very special. We took it to Cannes uh, and the response was, uh, you know, it was really good because, you know, you, you sort of have a taste of your own. But this one, we felt that, you know, it had a universal appeal. It's a, it's a very, it's a very sort of a touching film, if you like. It's quite dark and it's a thriller, and it has lots of things that can shock and keep, you know, the action fans uh, on the edge of their seats. But it does have a very strong, sort of a, a very strong sort of meaning about, you know, right and wrong. It's about, you know, people, people that are vulnerable getting taken advantage of, and you know, Adam Clay is a man that comes and sets those things and uh, of course corrects those moments. Well, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a group of people that, you know, this kind of goes on every day. Uh, and, you know, they're essentially, they're scammers. Uh, and they, you know, they make a phone call or they send an email. Uh, and they, you know, they get people's uh, attention by 
saying that they have a virus in their computer or something and you know they people don't want to don't know how to deal with those things especially the elderly uh, and the elderly are the people that they target because you know they kind of so, they live solitary lives they don't have people to look out for them and protect them like you know young people do so they uh you know that's their first line of attack is to get their fingers into the bank accounts of the old and the vulnerable uh, you know as their life savings go down the pan everything gets you know siphoned out uh, and there's no accountability for this it just goes on and it's um it's a terrible terrible thing that happens in society we meet him he's at the beginning of the film and you know he's a retired sort of guy that just connecting with something that he has a love for which is you know uh making honey uh and you know removing the honey from the hives and he has this very you know sweet relationship with the honeybees and you know it's the uh it's the parallel between his actual title of being a beekeeper which we find out later on what what an, what the real version of a beekeeper is when we come to this sort of governmental kind of special society came up and he's you know he's living in the garden of a, a very sweet lady that you know they have these exchanges of pleasantries every day and they they have a very sweet connection it's almost like she's the mother he never had you know adam clay is a we we don't know too much about him apart from the fact that no one ever took care of him so we 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 can fill in the gaps about his you know his 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 childhood uh and you know this is this lady is a significant thing for him in his life that she has deep meaning uh and when she gets uh she becomes a victim of the the, the cyber crime of the of the scammers that take advantage uh <clears throat> and he decides to get in front of that and take it all the way to the top and as the movie escalates uh we get to understand that it's the you know the everything is much bigger than we anticipated it to be well i think the more of the mystery that we can retain the better it is because when you tell too much about the guy what we do know he has an incredible skill set he's almost like a super soldier that is there to protect society when the balance when society can't protect itself he's the person the beekeepers come in to you know to recreate the equilibrium and that's what uh, adam clay really stands for is one of these guys that doesn't really exist is a you know is this it almost like this ghost that comes in and course corrects what's uh, what's leaning to the left when it should be right in the middle rona is the uh, the daughter uh, of eloise which is the sweet lady that takes care of me uh and you know i live in a barn in her back garden um and you know she makes me dinner and i bring her honey and we have this almost like a mother son relationship and when verona turns up she's you know she's an fbi uh, agent and she finds her mum sort of dead in a chair uh, and i'm at the scene of the crime adam clay is at the scene of the crime and so there's a very you know sticky start for us too and there always is going to be that because she's on one side of the law and Adam Clay is on his side of the law which is the right side <laughs> i mean the law is the law but when it fails you know there's very it's it's difficult to you know sometimes the law gets in the way of what right and wrong is you know uh the the protocols of what's allowed can be obstructive so uh Adam Clay takes the 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 reins on that and you know what's right and wrong is very important to him. You know I've been very lucky to work with uh with David and you know people like David are very rare. They they're an auteur, they're a, a writer, a director. Uh you know a, they're just they have this you know immersive kind of obsession in film uh, and what David does on a film set is is just unique. You know he's he can change anything he wants to change at that moment we can rewrite on the spot you know he's there holding camera he's finding and fishing for the right angles he works very closely with all you know the dp and he's a very cinematic he's very photographic and most directors you know sit behind a monitor and you know they can you know call action and cut and but you know david's right there he's he's almost he's he's on top of you in that scene he's holding the camera and you feel his energy you know what he's trying to extract from you uh he's very he's very articulate and he's very clear with what he needs 
and it's all a man could ever want. You know, it's a lot of people don't have that skill and it's an innate skill to him. He's very gifted in that world. Uh, you know, the, he's been rewarded for his re writing. He's been rewarded for his filmmaking. And, you know, people are you know, knocking down doors to work with him. So we feel very lucky that we were able to work together. And yeah, this is a very special one. Uh, you know, I sit here now, the movie's over. <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, I, I can honestly say I, I, I've been inspired every day when I come in and work with him. The stunt team that we have has been second to none. Uh, you know, we've got a young guy, Jeremy Marinas, coming in with his team from the US. And, you know, um, we're trying to do something that is very visceral and, you know, very shocking uh, and believable. So we're not trying to do something over, overly spectacular in kinds of its dazzle. We're trying to keep things very real, very dangerous, and very efficient. And I think that's what Adam Clay does. He, he provides efficiency rather than something uh, overly flamboyant in terms of the, you know, the fancy stuff. So we've kept it very real and very, very almost military-driven kind of danger. Um, and this is all driven by David. This is his whole vision. He's the leader. We come in, we have ideas, but really his ideas are never anything other than great. Uh, and we just want to, we want to, uh, you know, exact those ideas. Part of this movie is, is something that would translate to any country, any, any family, anywhere, any person that would have heard of something uh, of this nature that, you know, it, once we set things in motion, we're, you know, we're off for a ride, you know. It's, uh, the, these scumbags really get taken apart. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's the, the cause is, is so justified. Uh, and I think everyone, want, everyone has a, an attachment to someone in their family that might have been, uh, you know, preyed upon, uh, be, be getting conned in some way. It's out there. And I think everyone in their life will have come across that in some way, whether it's within their immediate inner family or, or a friend or someone that has, has been, um, you know, has been taken to the cleaners, as they say. <laughs> um, and it's not good. So I think there's a social justice to it that is, has a global appeal. All kinds of history to the, uh, the power of the bee. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's remarkable things about honey, you know, it's thousands of years old, you know, they find pots of honey in, in tombs that, you know, you could still eat today. It never goes off, it never spoils or sours. Uh, it has some amazing qualities. It, you can set it on fire. <laughs> yeah, there is, you know, the ways that, you know, the bees work. Uh, you know, without the bees, we wouldn't be here. You know, it's, um, they're a very special, integral part of nature and the cycle of life. So, yeah. We've learned a little few things about the bees. When I first got my hands on the script, I was super excited about it. I, one, <laughs> know that bees are very important to the survival of us and our planet. So I was intrigued with the bee knowledge and mythology and um, plot line, having Adam Clay be a beekeeper, but then also him being a different kind of beekeeper. So I was intrigued by the duality of those two things at play. Um, and I think Verona, Verona's storyline was also really intriguing to me. I think this woman is, we meet her in an extreme moment of grief and shock and sadness um, and the loss of her mother. And then she kind of has to put that aside to, to do her job and do her duty and the duty that she swore an oath to do. And it's conflicting. And I, I love the rub that she has with knowing what's right and doing what's right and doing what she swore an oath to do, but also feeling conflicted because here's a man who is taking a different route and a route that she's not supposed to take, but he's actually getting the job done and getting, a, getting the job done a lot faster than she is. Um, and so I love that conflict that is, that is living inside of her with, with, coming into um, coming into the orbit of clay and how he does things but then also being stuck behind you know bureaucracy and 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 you know all the red tape of being a government official and a government employee
In playing Verona, you know, she she's heartbroken. She's devastated. She just lost her mother in a very shocking way, and she's needs to grieve that. But we also meet her in a moment where she there isn't time to grieve her mother because this massive investigation is unraveling right in front of her eyes, and she's kind of in the middle of it. And she is closely related to one of the main and the initial victim, which is her mother, but then she also has this interesting relationship and dynamic that is evolving throughout the film with Adam Clay and his, his revenge journey that he's on. And I think she's conflicted. I think um, she, the, the people that he is acting out his revenge on are people that are criminals and crooks and people that are stealing money from vulnerable vulnerable people and and ruining many many lives especially you know the elderly and the vulnerable and and people that are easy targets and that disgusts her and so he is he's doing dir the dirty work and i can't say that she doesn't not agree with what he's doing but i think she also has to take a different route because she's you know she's not um <laughs> she herself is not a beekeeper <laughs> she is a special agent and there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of red tape um so i think she's conflicted which i think that is so juicy as an actor to um to get to play and get to explore the 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 conflict of moral conflict in general is, is really um is really juicy and also who doesn't love a revenge story Love a revenge story. <laughs> Portraying Verona has been really exciting and, and um, there's a lot to chew on. I think when we meet her, you know, she's, she's just arrived very shortly after the death of her mother and that's a shocking discovery. And uh, her and her mom, I believe had a very complicated relationship because she also lost her brother uh, in action um, a couple years before. And I think so her, she does have an estranged relationship with her family. And so I think she finds herself at this crossroads of, of needing to discover what happened to her mom and uncover the reasons why she did what she did, but also how Clay is involved and how involved he is. Um, but also having to put her personal feelings aside so that she can be the one that's on this case because a lot of times you're not allowed to mix business and your personal life. And so I think she really has to keep a lid on her grief and her emotions so that it doesn't get in the way of her work. And so she can, um, you know, go on this journey, which I do think in turn is, is the case of a lifetime for her, at least in this stage of her career. This is something that her and Wiley have been working on for years and they've gotten no traction and they've, they've made very little discoveries. And, and then sadly, the death of her mother kind of kicks off, um, pop, blows open the lid on the whole thing and, and involves Clay. And, and you know, Clay is on a, a revenge journey and I think who doesn't love a good, a good revenge journey? <laughs> it's a tricky one. I think it's tricky because I think he, is not bound by the red tape and the paperwork and approvals um, by, you know, people with classifications that, um, that Verona and Wiley don't have. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, steps involved to, to being an FBI agent and taking down criminals and hackers and con men. And Clay is skipping all of that and getting the job done. And it's definitely not the way that it should be done, but I think Wiley and Verona, and especially Verona, really struggle with, with the morality of that. And, and yes, he's getting the job done, and yes, he's doing things that they would never be able to do in the positions that they're in, but he's also, you know, running around taking down entire office buildings with all of their employees um, in a single moment. And that's, you know, that's not the ideal way to uh, take down these, you know, regional call centers and, and criminals and crooks. But, uh, but I think that's what's so fun to play with is the, is the conflict between, you know, the job is getting done, but it's not getting done by Verona and it's not getting done in the way that she's supposed to do it. So that's fun. <laughs> I think 
it switches hands every now and then. I think, I think Wiley's really concerned about Verona and her well-being and how she's handling this and how she's handling the grief and the loss of her mother and, and her ability to kind of suppress that grief to, to work this case. I think that concerns him. I think they are as close to brother and sister as they can be. I think they deeply care for each other and respect each other and look out for each other. But I do think that they feel the same about Clay. I think they both see that without him, they wouldn't be as far along in this case as they are at this point in the movie. And I think it's also frustrating because Clay leaves a lot of wreckage for them. So they're always kind of arriving after the fact and when it's a little bit too late and the damage is already done, uh, which I think is really frustrating. But I do think as the movie progresses, they do start to, and I think especially Rona, you know, start to question this oath that she's taken and, and is, is the government that she works for and the people that she works for and all of the, the rules that she has to abide by, is that actually getting the job done? Is that actually making a difference? And so I think they both start to question that throughout the film. The Beekeeper is played by the one and only Jason Statham, and in the movie his name is Adam Clay. <laughs> and Adam Clay keeps bees, which is amazing. I'm always envious of beekeepers. I think I'm frightened of bees, but we need them. They're very important. Um, but I, I understand beekeeping, I think, um, especially for Clay, I think there is a level of, of purity and um, purpose that exists and is, is vital to the success of a beehive to produce honey. Um, and I think it's calming for him because not only is he a keeper of bees, he is also a beekeeper, which is an extremely classified program of mercenaries, assassins, fixers, cleaners, you name it. Um, so I think having lived a life like that, which is I'm sure nothing but extremes, having, you know, his real life and his personal life be something that is very calming and requires a lot of dedication and focus and patience. Um, I think that's probably exactly what he needs. I'm having the best time working with Jason Statham. I, I, I will admit I was nervous because he's a legend <laughs> and he is, you know, a massive action star and actor and, and you know, I, I, you never know what to expect when meeting people that you've seen in so many movies and are, are iconic in Hollywood and, and it's just been so lovely and he's so personable and so down to earth and our first day on set together was one of our, one of the first scenes in the movie, which is a pretty intense scene for both of us. It's after the loss of my mother and, and you know, him kind of being there for me as, as, as moral support and, and kind of, you know, unraveling himself just enough uh, <laughs> to, to let me in and, and intrigue uh, Verona. But, um, you know, and it was just the two of us sitting in a kitchen drinking coffee, having a really intimate two-hander two scene. And it was incredible. I think he's such an incredible actor and he's a really good listener on screen and, and in real life. Um, we've just had some great chats and, and I think this movie for him, I think it was really important to David to dive into the the human side of these characters and their emotional journeys. And um, yes, there is all of the action and all of the fights and the guns and the blood and like everything that you want in an amazing action movie. But there's also this really deep layer of, of emotional, um, like a, a very deep emotional well for these characters to, to dive into. And it's, it's really exciting and it's been really fun to, to uncover that as we go and, and kind of get to see everybody progress in their emotional journey on this, on this film. Verona Parker would be nothing without her partner, Wiley, played by the one and only Bobby Nadiri. And it's been 
it's <laughs> it's been the best time. We from from day one, him and I just got on like a house on fire, and you know we are in essentially every scene together and have to have you know this very close intimate brother sister energy connection inside jokes that has to you know read reach through the camera and I I don't know how David did it I'd never met Bobby before we started working on this we never chemistry read together but they cast both of us separately and from the moment that we met we just both knew that we were just gonna have the best time and we just make fun of each other all day and laugh and and really um, just play off of each other every day at work and and kind of tee up the joke for each other when you know when it's time and and I just think it's organically turned into this great friendship on and off camera and I'm I'm feel so so lucky to to have been put in his orbit and get to know him as an actor because I just I think he's an incredible actor and, and partner and um, yeah he's all right <laughs> I mean, this cast is pretty stacked. We've got Jeremy Irons, we've got Jason Statham, Bobby Nadiri, we've got Josh Hutcherson, which is, who's a dream, such a sweetheart. We've got Minnie Driver, and then the also legendary Felicia Rashad is playing my mother. Can you even? Hello? What? <sighs> I mean, what? This cast is insane. <laughs> I think when you're embarking on a movie that is being directed by David Ayers, starring Jason Statham, you know that the level of stunts and action is going to be through the roof, top notch. And our stunt team has absolutely killed it. It's, un it's unbelievable. I'm, I, I don't get to do a lot of fighting, but I do do a lot of running around with a gun <laughs> and multiple guns and um, uh, a couple other projects. I've I've had you know some tactical training, but not to the level I have. Um, I've been lucky enough to have on this, um, getting to work with firearms and just you know furthering my education because I um, you know playing an FBI agent, you need to look like you know what you're doing when you're running around with a giant weapon strapped to your chest. I'm just trying to make <laughs> make the FBI proud, I suppose. Um, so it's been it's been actually really educational and and uh, you know, I've, I've I don't have a lot of knowledge of 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 weaponry, so I've I've just been kind of soaking all of that up and and trying to um, to feel and come off as authentic as possible while, you know, running around and, and chasing Jason all over the place and running upstairs and downstairs and busting through doors and um, and it's 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 been really um, it's been really exciting and, and really um, kind of on the fly which you know I I'm usually not very good at but but David is is kind of changed my perspective on on, um, on just being in the moment and having things happen on the fly, <laughs> um, especially when it comes to you know action and, and fighting, a lot of that is so re you know rehearsed and choreographed, and because it has to be, it's dangerous. Um, so it's been a perfect mix of oh, <laughs> um, it's been a perfect mix of of just in the moment and also you know lots of training beforehand so that you know in the moment we have all the information we need to have so that we can kind of pull off the impromptu moments to the best of our ability. I have nothing but amazing things to say about David Ayers. This, um, this experience has been just so fun and lovely and exciting and um, and I, you know, I, I believe that energy always trickles down from the top. And I think the moment that I met David via Zoom, I just could tell that we were gonna get on great and have a great experience. And I, I, he's an actor's director. I think he really cares about his actors and wants them to feel as comfortable and as, as prepared and as set up for success as possible. And I, you know, coming from theater, there's, we 
rehearse constantly. There's so much rehearsal, we, weeks and weeks and weeks, months even, years sometimes, um, before you know a show gets put up on Broadway, and and it's kind of the opposite in in TV and film. You don't get a lot of re rehearsal time, but I think that is something that is really important to David. I think he loves t rehearsals. He loves trying new things. He loves being in the moment, also. Um, and so I I was really excited by that and his process and I I think he he's really gotten me out of my shell of, of feeling like I have to understand and have control over every moment all the time um, because you know so much of being an actor you can only control really what happens between action and cut like that's the little control that we have is kind of in these like finite moments and so I think trying to control those moments as much as possible, but David's style is, is, is different. It's very like, let's just see what happens. And I, you know, I've, I've, I've really learned to like love that and kind of live in, you know, sometimes it's chaotic and there's people running all over and there's all this action happening and helicopters are flying and it feels crazy. And he kind of encouraged you. He's like, yes, this is insane. So let's live in that. <laughs> That's OK. We don't have to normalize that, you know, giant helicopters are flying and there's people running around everywhere. And, you know, I think um, I, I've really I've really enjoyed getting to explore that that part of myself as an actor and also getting to work with him and and getting to know his directing style. And it's unlike any director I've ever worked with. And I. I just admire him so much and I think he's so good at what he does and how he sees shots and moments and and angles and um, yeah I just I, I trust him completely and I think he's I just think he's so wonderful at what he does and I've felt nothing but safe and um, inspired and encouraged and and trusted and protected through this whole process which as an actor like that's truly it's very rare and and um, and yeah, I'm just grateful for that. I think people are gonna really love this movie. It's exciting, it's thrilling, it's so action-packed, it's unbelievable, but I do think that there is a deep level of heart and emotion and groundedness in this movie that's really exciting and there's a ton of moral conflict, which who doesn't love moral conflict and who doesn't love revenge? I mean, playing Derek is, is a pretty big departure for me. Um, he's an absolute maniac who is, you know, f high on power, high on money, and high on um, many substances. Um, so I typically try to stay away from a lot of those things myself. Uh, but it was just going into the headspace of somebody who is just on a tear, and his ego and narcissism are just, like, firing at levels that no one should ever experience. It was, uh, it's a lot. It's, it's exhausting, but it's really fun to just tap into a whole other side of yourself that you didn't know existed and you kind of find out it's scary that it can't exist. I found it very funny. Um, I think that there's like a real dark humor that's kind of throughout and, and working with David Ayer as well, he's got a very dark sense of humor that he pulls out of scenes and moments that are very unexpected. So I thought it was just an enjoyable read. I think that the, the story of revenge and like what does justice really look like what does one man's justice look like compared to other people's and, and just kind of what violence and destruction can, can become if you let vengeance kind of take hold of you. Derek is, uh, he's in an interesting spot because he comes from a lot of money. His family is like titans of industry with shipping and old oil money, so he feels kind of untouchable in many ways. And he's made most of his money legitimately through crypto, NFT, and he's got a really fast, intelligent kind of uh, business mind. But he kind of has this dark secret on the side that's his passion project, which is very evil. And that's when, you know, he runs these centers that basically rob older people of their life savings. Um, and I talked with David a bit about why. <laughs> like, why does Derek do this? Like, he has the money, he has power, why does he want this thing? And I think it kind of comes back to what we sort of landed on was he wants something that's his dirty little secret that no one else can touch that and and operating outside the bounds of law when his mom is you know the commander in chief there's something that just gets that part of him going of of wanting to be as powerful as possible so he has this 
dark, secret, nasty little little side side hustle that brings in a lot of money as well. Um, and ultimately, it's his uh, his downfall. Working with David has, has been incredible. I mean, you know, we go from shooting a scene where he'll come up and give you like two words of direction about like tell him about the machine elves, and you're like the what? He's like the machine elves, like when you smoke DMT and you go to the other dimension, the machine elves mock you and then you go back. So tell your mom about that, which I think is very funny and dark and very Dave, uh, very um, Derek-like. And then the next moment he'll come to you and he'll tell you, like the piece of direction he gave me in one of the scenes with Gemma, who's playing my mom, he was like, all of us just want to love and be loved with the tools that we have. And then you're like, shit, okay. Wow, now I gotta bring that into the fold. So he'll like work you into one space and then kind of bring it to another very grounded human emotion space, which I think is just really, it's really enjoyable. And for me as an actor to get to play with that kind of range of, of direction is really, really great. Dave and I had a few conversations about this as well. And uh, you know, I think that there's a part of Derek that is projecting his father onto Westwild and kind of He's in a position of power over Westwild, so there's there's a part of Derek that enjoys just messing with Westwild and kind of making him do whatever he wants. In a way, it's kind of like the thing of, of being more powerful than your father and, and wanting to like supersede everything that they do and, and become a better version of them. So I think that he projects a lot of that onto Westwild. I think Westwild is just holding on for dear life with whatever this kid's about to do wrong to get them into even more trouble. So it's. It's, it's a very fun dynamic, and Jeremy Irons, I mean, obviously he's you know, a legendary actor and he brings such power and, and, and weight into every moment. And then to get to play the character that's kind of bullying him as this like, younger, like, shithead kind of guy, I think it's really fun. And uh, it's created a lot, of great, a lot of great moments. Derek, when we start this film, feels invincible. He feels that no one can touch him, nothing can bring him down. And, and at first, it's a, it's a nuisance, it's like this, and he says it in the script, I say that he's a crash test dummy with a gun. And that's kind of what he views Clay as for most of the movie until he's literally blowing open the doors and taking care of business. So I think that, you know, it starts off being a nuisance and basically Derek's a guy where he just is like, it's not my problem. Like I pay people stupid amounts of money. You guys fix this. Like, don't bother me with all this nonsense. Like, yeah, some guy who got pissed off. Okay, cool, whatever. Like, go do your job. And that's very much Derek's mentality until it's inescapable and, and yeah, things come all, everything comes crashing down. Derek is kind of isolated a bit in his own little world and his world really consists of West Wild and uh, his mom, who's, who's Gemma Redgrave, who's a phenomenal actress and again, like a powerhouse. So I get to be this like annoying surrounded by powerhouse actors. <laughs> it just, it's really fun. Um, but, but Gemma was incredible and, and she, as well as, you know, as, as Jeremy and with, with David's direction, just find these very nuanced, truthful moments. And, you know, David will be giving her direction about, like, you're going to walk in and you're having a cigarette and you guys, like, used to do drugs together. So it's like, okay, that's one way of looking at the mother-son relationship. And, the other, and then all of a sudden he'll tell her, now all you care about is wanting to see your son survive this moment. And so in, in just having actors that are as dynamic as, as Gemma and, and Jeremy, to be able to take those directions and run with them, but yet keep them very grounded, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a blessing that you don't get very often. Eric was originally written as kind of very dapper, very clean cut, put together, three piece suit kind of guy. Um, but then when I came on board, David's vision of Derek started to change and uh, we just leaned into this guy who has so much money not really any sense of style, but just needs to be like big swinging. That's like his whole thing is like green is his color, money, power, gold, green. Like that's his world 100%. And, uh, and then we decided, I was, it was funny because after I, when I did the Hunger Games, they had my hair bleached blonde and I hated it so much, like the whole process and it was so annoying. And I said, I'm never dyeing my hair blonde again for a project. And then the moment I got the call from the hair and makeup team and they're like, hey, so we're thinking about maybe like bleaching your hair. I was like, oh, that sounds amazing. Let's do it. I completely forgot about like all of my past ideas of what I would or wouldn't do, um, which is a very me thing to do. But it, uh, you know, I think that having this crazy hair, he's got normally he has like a diamond gold stud earring. He's got, he mixes patterns. Like I've got this floral, I don't even know what silk with like snakeskin boots. It's just, he's, He's so out of touch with reality, and I think that trying to express that through his clothing as well 
um, was, was really enjoyable. I only got to shoot one scene with Jason. He's a delight. He's an absolute workhorse. And that guy is like, it's like a fine watch. It's like perfectly tuned. He's always on it. He never misses a beat. Um, and you know, from every time that I was shooting my scenes, he was on the second unit action stunt team killing hundreds of people. Like this, this man was just nonstop working. Um, but I didn't get to spend a lot of time with him, unfortunately. The Danforth compound, I mean, that's really the, the whole climax of the movie takes place there. And um, you know, we've gone through a lot, especially Clay has gone through a lot to get to that point in the story. And uh, it's just, the walls are, are falling around Derek and you know, he's kind of gotten to this point where he's in blind rage, uh, coke and whiskey fueled rage. And you know, he's basically watching as what he thought was impossible was actually becoming possible, which is that someone can get to him and someone can take him down. Um, but it's shooting that was, it was, it's a monster. I mean, you know, it's probably like 18 pages of the script happened there in that compound, including multiple huge scenes between me and, and Gemma where I'm, you know, pleading with her and begging her for her love. And it's just like tempers at an all time high, like voices cracking, like emotionally very, very strenuous. And we did, we did one take, it was like a six page scene, maybe five page scene. And we did one take where, uh, David wouldn't cut. He would just reset and reset and reset. It ended up being like a 30 minute take without cutting. And we're like, my heart was pounding. I was dripping in sweat. It was just very like physically exhausting. Um, but I enjoyed it. It's really like when you, when you get to a point where you've done, you do a take that's that long and you're just worn so far down, you find new things and like you express things in ways that are than you, than you differently than you normally would approach them. So it was a joy and uh, a mountain to climb for sure. It's hard to really describe this film, but kind of what I've been telling people, like the short version of it is it's like, an epic vengeance story about a guy who has a very peculiar set of skills. He keeps bees, which is very weird, but he's also part of this large organization of beekeepers that are these super secret kind of government high level assassins basically. And I get on his wrong side and he basically is on a, a kill streak of trying to, to get to me to take down this, this evil corporation that I've set up, which robs old people of their life savings. So it's a story of, of searching for justice and really like what does justice mean and how that looks for different people's perspectives. I think that this film obviously is gonna have insane sequences of action, you know, with Jason at the helm and just kicking ass and cars exploding and it's gonna have all of that stuff and, and done in a very unique dynamic sort of fight choreography way. But then also it's just a badass story of, of vengeance about one man whose desire to, to bring justice to someone, uh, he'll stop at nothing. And so it, it's that, it's also funny, I think. Maybe it's just my twisted humor, but I think it's darkly funny. And my character is so ridiculous, he's laughable in so many ways, but always grounded in reality. So it's, it's, just, it's a dark, grounded action comedy that's hyper-violent. It happened to my great-grandma, which is funny. I just actually just now realized that, like my, my great grandma, this is probably a few years ago, she's still alive, she's like 94 and drinks bourbon, she's amazing. But she was, uh, one night, she calls my little brother and she's like, Connor, I can't, I can't take this anymore, you have to tell your family. My brother's like, Grandma, what are you talking about? And, and she's like, Connor, don't, don't, please, I can't take it anymore. He's like, he's like, Grandma, I don't know what you're talking about. And she was like, you called me two nights ago and said that you got arrested and you'd had too many glasses of champagne after someone's wedding and you got arrested and you needed money to get you out of prison, but not to tell anybody. And my brother's like, oh no, no grandma, that, I didn't do that. She's like, yes you did. And she, I guess like somebody called her and she went to like Walmart and bought Apple gift cards and then scratched off the back and then read the, like did that whole thing. And it's evil, man, it's evil. And like my grandma is such a sweet woman. <laughs> And like, she wants to help everybody, but she is susceptible in ways, you know? And, and she answers the, her house phone, which she still has every time. And it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's evil. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty dark. I'm on Clay's side, man. Get him, take him down. Take me down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, David made sure that I had time with Chuck, who was our FBI consultant, who was on the force for at the Bureau for 30 years. So we had like a four hour conversation and we had access to him on set and before. But what, what I loved about Wiley was uh, from the script and talking to David about it, he handles really intense situations 
he switches between either he's intense or humor, finding the light moment, the grounded moment. Um, and I found that fascinating in his life as, you know, he has kids at home, very family man, um, just very good heart. And when he goes to work, he's dealing with just, you know, insane situations that can really have a, a toll on, on the human being behind the, you know, the agent or the officer. Um, and I had experience playing um, law enforcement and soldiers and that before, but this was the first time um, being an FBI agent and learning about the history and the, the differences and just kind of the inner workings that um, I got to learn. And that's what I find really, really fun is that research part going into it and throughout. Super engaging. I loved the bee uh, mythology, symbolism, the, the correlation with our society. Uh, I just heard, like I think most people, how important bees are to our planet. And that's kind of woven in into the story. And I, I loved how, I don't want to ruin anything, but I loved how the, the story starts where you're automatically deeply emotionally um, engaged with Clay and what his story evolves to and uh, the, the story of, um, gosh, Wiley and Verona and Verona's dealing with this situation and he's kind of like, uh, you know, a shoulder you know, moving through the story. So I thought all that worked. Absolutely. I mean, I, I have conversations with my folks and I'm like, don't answer that email. Don't pick up that text. Um, it's a scam. Don't do it. And even if it's not, it's better safe, you know, than, than replying or actually giving up your information because I guess, sadly, that's the world we're living in right now. The first time we meet Wiley is uh, a phone conversation between him and Verona's character right after uh, what's going on with, with her story and kind of like the emotional uh, event that propels her and, you know, personal and her, her work job. And we meet him and we see him in his home. So the first time we actually meet Wiley is him uh, and you see his everyday morning with the kids and his wife. And then we're propelled into this chaotic adventure of this, you know, secret organization that no one really knows anything about. But Wiley does have a little bit more, and there's a lot of secrets that's been implanted throughout the story with, with him and w whatever he, he leads on to know, um, which is always fun as an actor to play with. And that's discussions me and David had throughout the process from what we uh, originally knew was like there's something fishy going on there's definitely some sort of scam but in my thought process and I think in the story we think that's kind of where it ends you don't you don't think that it's like a, you know a river leading to this massive uh, catch so I, it's probably some young people who are tech savvy who have been doing this I don't think I think they're basically unveiling of like, oh wow, how deep does this run and how connected it is as they're pulling the strings. So I, yeah, I think originally it was maybe controlled to that call center and then you have this, this group of scammers. But as they inch closer, they realize, oh, this is much deeper and darker than what they thought originally. For Wiley, Originally, you know, he's obviously this vigilante. We don't even know what's going on. He's, he shouldn't, this is breaking the law. You can't take justice into your own hands like this. That's why we have, you know, our justice system. But as the story starts un un unveiling and pushing forward, I think one side of Wiley, he knows more than he gives away. And the other side, which we, you see in real time, is that he's like, well, maybe, maybe this is the answer and maybe this is a when everything else is crumbling this will set things straight so he's very conflicted and we see that through his arc um, hopefully <laughs> if I do my job once we realize how deep this can go then it's like I don't even know if we're allowed 
Like what's like there is this kind of and then it becomes maybe personal and curiosity. And it's also the fact that you're already in this. You're already wrapped up into this. And it's like, well, that veil is going to fall. And behind that might not be something pleasant, um, which I think makes the story exciting. Yeah, so I had some experience before um, with uh, weapons training and stunts, but with this, which m much more intense. So I was here about a week and a half earlier. So I got to work with the stunt team, who these guys are incredible. And they kind of put me through that. And then we had weapons training and they were amazing. And we got to actually go and fire off, you know, and, and really get that feel um, into it. And that's been so key so that you're not just, you know, miming it and put, you know, like you're actually, you have it in your system of how that feels, the weight and, and what it actually does, you know, um, which I loved. Oh, Emmy's wonderful. We, as soon as we had never met before, but as soon as we got to London and we met at the studio, it was instant. We had that chemistry um, and super talented and very easy to work with which has been amazing because if, if we didn't have that, it would be a <laughs> very different shoot. But I think David uh, knew me well enough and, and, and uh, had met with Emmy, so he knew our energies were gonna work together. So it's been loads of fun. He's absolutely lovely. Um, I've got to hang out with him on set. We haven't had any scenes. We have stuff coming up where we have a, a fight scene and sadly I, I don't win that. <laughs> um, so I'm excited to do that with him, but, you know, constant professional and it's incredible to watch him do all the stunt stuff, which is, he, he, he's just like mastered that portion of it. David's incredible because one, he, he genuinely cares about the, the, the acting portion of it and we, we got to have rehearsals, we would sit in his office and just work through the script. And for me, one of the things that always draws me to him, and I've worked with him numerous and over and over again, is that he really trusts his actors. And that in itself makes me trust him and kind of lets you play and, and, and explore ideas you have, um, which is kind of rare. And I think that's what makes him an incredible director. I think everyone might have their own interpretation, which I think makes it great. To me, <clears throat> there is this, uh, the protector, right? And kind of the organizer of like a, a, a system that needs to function for society or your beehive to function. The beekeeper is um, kind of like an outside force that has, is keeping the system flowing and working the way it's used to, used to until there is an issue where then they interfere and can go in there and rectify the situation. I think off bat from the start of the, the, the movie, they will connect emotionally, which then you, the audiences will follow this, you know, the, the, the two parallel stories of Jason going on this, you know, vengeance journey and uh, Emmy and Wiley's character trying to figure out what's going on and realizing, wait, who's doing good, who's doing bad, and then it just gets crazier and crazier. But I think the audience will get sucked in immediately and um, hopefully uh, connect with the story. Here is Matt Wiley. He is uh, an FBI agent and he's partnered up with uh, Verona Parker, played by Emmy. And basically they've been investigating this uh, scammer group that has been ripping off people, targeting the elderly. And in that there is a tragedy and that kind of all connects to this deeper, much darker conspiracy that they're discovering as they're putting it all together. And it just becomes more and more insane as the story goes forward. And it kind of just leads all the way to the top um, when they get to the White House and go, wow, how did we get this deep when we thought it was just some punk kids who were hackers?
what I've been thinking about it, what makes him so special and why actors want to work with him is he's so alive and we will come up with moments as we're going and the, the script is our foundation, but it, when, when we're bringing it to life, he's very open and he's, he's such a creative person and that kind of rubs off around you. And that's what I think helps the story of not just being a genre action movie to actually bring a heart and, 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 and personality and authenticity to it because of who he is as a person and the way he directs. And I don't know, I, I think there's just something about him as a person and his resume that you're just like, you know what, I will jump in the trenches with you. Where are we going? And that trust, I think, is the number one in working with the director, that if I trust you, you know, let's go, you know? And, and I, I've always felt that with him from the first time I've worked with him till now. And I think that is super special to me. It's rare, it's, it's not common. And, and I think people can forget and we kind of get into the, the, the work aspect of it. And he brings that creativity and playfulness and, and while still having that intensity of getting to the heart of the story and making it emotional while you have this fantastic action and intensity happening. Eloise Parker is a retired school teacher who is living on a farm that she has um, owned many, many years. I probably inherited it. Um, and she has a tenant, a Mr. Clay. And Mr. Clay is a very interesting and a little bit of an odd kind of person. He's, um, he's not very verbal. Uh, in not communicative in that sense, but he is, uh, he's pleasant and, uh, and appears to her as a little lonely. And she's a little lonely too as her children all, everybody's gone, <laughs> you know, everybody's gone. What attracted me to this? Because that happened to my mother. That actually did happen to my mother, and uh, fortunately, I was able to put a stop to it. Yes, uh, there are all kinds of scams, and and the people try to sound so friendly when you call. You know, uh, they try to sound so friendly, and they're so personal and so personable, and they're just thieves. There are thieves, you know. So this is what attracted me to it because I, I know that it's real. I know that this does happen to people and it happens every single day, unfortunately. It will unfold as they see it, but it makes so much sense, you know, the definition of it as, as everything, on, as the story unfolds and you understand the beekeeper as we see him initially and the beekeeper as he is in another way. Uh, I, I, I thought that was very clever writing Actually, I thought it was very intelligent writing. I liked that a lot. Eloise, according to what Clay says himself, is the first person who ever took care of him. You know? And he, um, that means a lot to him. And, and he doesn't say much. He's a person who doesn't say much. He internalizes, you know? And, and uh, I can tell you just in that one scene that we had, that one encounter with, in which he says that to, uh, to Eloise, um, it was so truthful, so honest. He's a very honest actor. I, I like working with him. Could we talk about David Ayer? <laughs> this is my first time meeting David as well. And um, I can say that I, I do not recall ever being on a set in which the director actually got behind the camera. And he did, to line up a shot, to get it just like he wanted. Because I, um, he's very visual in telling his stories, right? It isn't just a close-up on the actor. It isn't just a close-up on that person. It's that 
it's what the whole scene is. What's there, yes, and what's behind what you see immediately. He really, and then he's, he's, he's really cool. He's like, um, he too doesn't talk a lot. <laughs> he doesn't, he doesn't. He's just very even. He's extremely kind and polite. And he knows what he's looking at and he knows what he wants. I agree with you. This is a very powerful premise in this film, this, this scam issue. And this film built around it and the levels in which it is taking place within the film. Uh, and the levels of people who are involved in it, knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you look at it like that, I could say, you could almost think it's a horror film because <laughs> it's so horrible that it happens. <laughs> it's, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's a very deep premise. This is called Castle Farm. Uh, we're in the countryside in England. And I wish you could see this lavender field, just a whole field with lavender. And then on the other side, there are cows. And further up the road, there's sheep. And there are rolling hills and a crop of trees at the top of the hill. It's pastoral and beautiful. People are living here in the house in which we filmed Eloise, Eloise in her kitchen. I understand that the house is like 500 years old. Uh, this barn that I'm sitting in right now as I'm speaking to you, I'm looking at it, and truthfully, it is four to 500 years old. Uh, the people who built in those days of master craftsmen, because it's still standing. It's like a walk in history while staying in the present. It's really quite nice. This is a wonderful set. It's a very warm set. Oh, and this is the other thing about this film. It's a pageantry of notable actors, a pageantry of great actors. When I'm in the makeup trailer and I look up at the wall and you see photographs of all the actors who were in the film, it was like, oh my goodness. And there's this one and there's that, oh yeah, and that one too. It's, it's great. Well, I read the script and it's an action script. They're sometimes hard to to get through because there's so much action. But I found this script a real page turner. I thought it was a fantastic story. Um, the action was very well described and we're now beginning to see it being filmed. Uh, but I wanted to know what was gonna happen. It really pushed me on. And I thought, well, if it's that good a read, um, it's probably gonna be that good a film. So I was interested to take part, particularly since the character that I was asked to play is fairly enigmatic, difficult to know where he stands, and we've refined this, I think, even more during the shooting. So I thought it, it'll be an interesting, uh, an interesting journey, and I was an admirer of David Ayres. So Eric Danforth is my employer, um, a young man, uh, sort of black sheep of the family, uh, with the craziness, and my job is to try to protect his family's company from his actions as much as I can. And he, the first time we meet, he comes to me, he has a big problem, a problem which at that moment I don't appreciate quite as deeply as I will come to do and I tell him to sort it out himself and then very soon after that I realize that I'm going to have to step in and call in favors from people I know through my life and my past life um, to try to sort the problem out but he's a uh, uh, he's a wild card and very difficult when he's a, your employer, which strictly he is, to deal with. The president is someone that I've known romantically before she became president. And uh, we have 
that relationship in the past. And I think it has something to do with why she asked me to look after her, her son. She knows I'm a, a, a trusted friend. Um, nevertheless, from where she stands, I'm not doing my job too well. So there is a friction there. But it's, a, it's an interesting little bit of color into the story. It's great working with Jason. I mean, he is uh, a master of what he does. Uh, very nice man, uh, quiet, uh, gentle, immensely professional, very fit. Um, of course, an Englishman who I, I've watched since he first appeared. Like any talented person, he's very easy to work with. He, uh, he's welcoming, he listens, he has a good mind, he's very good at what he has to do. And it made it a great pleasure to work with him. Well, Josh is uh, uh, a delightful young man. He's fantastic in the role, uh, easy to play with, comes at you with, uh, uh, with unexpected moments. Um, I think he'll be, uh, I think he's wonderfully cut out for this character. He's found a great way to play it. And our scenes were, were a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Even though my character and his character are very uh, ambivalent about each other. Well, he's very relaxed, very concentrated as a director. He, uh, of course, has written the script or done all the final adjustments on the script. So most of the clues of how to play the scene, how to play the character are there in the script. And with my experience, he largely leaves me alone, gives me an idea now and again. Um, he has a fantastic eye. He's a wonderful camera operator himself. And um, He's made it very easy uh, to do my scenes. And I've watched him. I've been involved in, in action scenes. And, you know, he surrounds himself with the best people, the best stunt guys. We have a fantastic cameraman, great crew. And so it's looking very good. And he, I think, just concentrates on making sure it's absolutely real and has all the qualities of the shots that he wants. So he's a, he's a quiet director on the set. You often have to hunt him down to find him. Um, but uh, he's the sort of director you trust. You know when he says he's got it, that he's got it. It's about corruption, the corruption of power, uh, how power corrupts, and um, the, to a certain extent, naivete of thinking that that can be dealt with easily. Uh, but it is endemic in our societies. And I think as we see it from a distance, hopefully, uh, a lot of us would like to be in Jason Statham's shoes. I think there'll be a lot of people out there who've been through this sort of scam uh, and who want retribution and, of course, in this internet Twitter world, it's very hard to get justice for some people whose uh, finances or whose security or whose reputation has been damaged by these uh, technological scams. Beekeepers are people who look after beehives, and beehives are very complicated systems, um, very finely tuned systems, and rather like society is and so the beekeeper is somebody who uh, sets about protecting that hive that system uh, and so they they carry the same name as the man who looks after the beehive well I, I think if they have as good a time as I as I did when I read the script you know it'd be fine of course what audiences want is to be excited, to be made to, made to think, to be uh, amused, uh, to be uh, thrilled. 
and I, I, and for it to be worth the money. And I think, um, I think with the beekeeper, they'll get all of that. I play a, a character who has spent his career in the diplomatic and then uh, in the CIA and then becoming the head of the CIA and then retiring and moving into, uh, so to speak, the corporate jungle. But uh, I'm asked by the uh, person who's running for president to look after, during her presidency, to look after her uh, large co company, multinational company. So Kurt's script had that thing that's really important to a movie and its structure. It, it was really smartly laid out and I'm pretty good at guessing turns and twists and things like that as a writer. But what Kurt did in his writing is he got ahead of me and, and if he can get ahead of me, I know I, I know he can get ahead. I know we can get ahead of the audience. And also, he he has a great sense of fun. The script had this great sense of fun. This great, you know, cast of these very dynamic, very kind of interesting characters. Um, nobody's flat. Everybody has a very unique perspective. So, you know, that's something I absolutely, you know, need as a director, as a filmmaker, to have that 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 definition in the characters and and it was just again like a lot of fun and a great opportunity for a lot of incredible action emmy's fbi partner in the film is bobby nadiri who's who's a great actor i love using him he can just blend in any role and he becomes sort of this uh, cynical conscious uh voice about what are they doing why are they doing it and i think because what they stumble across is so big and and so almost overwhelming that he gets a little scared by it and whereas Emmy is really trying to solve the murder of her mother and has that personal stake. Bobby is such a great character where, you know, it's his, they're, they're like a, a married couple. They have this great interaction, this incredible banner, and it's a lot of fun to watch their scenes together. But they are on the tail of something big and something scary. So sadly, a really common thing that happens is a lot of seniors, a lot of people that are vulnerable get targeted by these phishing scams. And, they can range from clicking on the wrong thing to a really sophisticated operation where people are really targeted and, and over several days can be drained of everything they have, everything they work for. They can lose the deeds to their house because these scammers are so good at what they do and so precise. And it was interesting, as we crewed up the movie, crew members would come on and, and everyone kind of had a story. Everyone had a story about someone they knew who had been scammed. Everybody had a story about something that almost happened to them or their mom or did happen. And it really opened my eyes to, to the scope of this problem. And, and it is nice to uh, be able to direct attention to something that people need to know about in a film. They need to know about this. You know, very important characters in the film, and they're the bad guys. They're, they're the bad guys and because they do bad things and condone bad things. Is uh, It's Jeremy Irons who incredible actor, just a really gifted actor, and I was so honored to work with him. It was such a pleasure to have him on set. He plays a former CIA director who has sort of come under the sway of a less than ethical crypto businessman, uh, played by Josh Hutchison. And Josh really, I think, developed himself in an interesting way uh, in this film because it's such a different character from anything we've ever seen him play. And he's such a good actor. Josh is an amazing actor. And then you combine him with, you know, a legend like Jeremy Irons. And now you have this incredible chemistry and you start to believe these characters. You start to believe them. Uh, you feel them. You have a sense of their desperation. And, and you have a sense of their growing desperation as they get chased by a beekeeper. So the idea... You know, we had an idea with Jason, something we really wanted to work with, um, out of Kurt's script, that he isn't a gun guy, per se. He's not, he's not running around with a weapon all the time. It's just a tool, one of many tools that he uses. And he may get a gun and take it apart and turn it into a stabbing weapon or a club. So it, it's kind of wild, you know, to see these things happen in the film, but a lot of work went into sort of creating these moments and really getting that dexterity and rehearsal it was almost the idea that um, you know beekeeper has hands like a magician, you know that they're he can he can do anything. Jeremy Marinas, who was my stunt coordinator, fight coordinator, 
just did a, an incredible job there because it's coming up with the grammar. What what does the movement look like? What do our fights even look like? You know, are they cowboy bra brawls? Are they are they cowboy brawls? Are they more sophisticated? And we have very sophisticated kind of fluid action that develops. And you know, the process is Jeremy writes action, shoots it on video. We present it to Jason. Jason has his ideas and he's really smart and he really knows what he's capable of and want to make sure that that is showcased in these stunt choreographies. Uh, then we practice and practice and practice and then I figure out how to get a camera on it and then you just grind on the day. You know, shooting action, I don't think people understand is there's a lot of repetition to it. It's a very physical, strenuous activity even for the crew. Um, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and when you see those shots, those dailies come out. Uh, and you, you know you're gonna take, you know, a treasure trove back to editorial and create an amazing stunt sequence. And, and it's just like being in the delivery room and watching something incredible come out. So Jason is very successful at upsetting the bad guys. And as he starts to dismantle their organization, they realize they need to do, do as he starts to dismantle their organization, they realize they need to do something and they need to do it fast. And they're sort of able to game the system and they get another, they get a beekeeper to go after a beekeeper. And so Anaset shows up, she's the, uh, the local beekeeper and it's her responsibility now to take out Jason who's retired. You know, beekeepers have their own politics and, and maybe we'll learn more about that in the future. But it's a really wild scene. She shows up at this gas station with a military Gatling gun and then proceeds to just absolutely cause havoc. And it, it was a lot of fun to choreograph that fight. Um, you know, there's several uh, rope pulls and, and special stunts we did. But it, it's also, it's just a lot of fun. It's a good popcorn moment. It's a great, it's a great fight sequence. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of stuff happening. And just to keep it exciting, we blew the place up at the end too, which was I think our last shot of the night, which is generally what you want to do when you blow up your set. And that gave us a nice fireball about 5 a.m. before the sun came up and we went home. So that was a tough day. You really look at, at the film, you know, the main driver of all the craziness happening is really Josh Hutcherson, who is this out of control kid, uh, privileged, comes from wealth, uh, comes from you know the, the the Silicon Valley crypto culture. Uh, probably was a Burning Man, and he is absolutely desperate and has no boundaries. And part of the fun of this, you know, watching this film, you never know what Josh Hutcherson is going to do next. You never know what outrageous things he's going to say. You never know how he's going to manipulate the people around him to solve his own problems. And Poor Jeremy Irons, you know, has to try and keep this guy safe. He, his job there is he's really head of security for someone who seems hell-bent on self-destruction. It's a good dynamic. There's nothing more thrilling for me as a director to have an incredible actor come on set. And this was a great opportunity to work with Minnie Driver. And she has a, a small but incredibly important role in the film. And I find that, you know, when you cast um, powerful people, when you cast government officials, um, it, it's important to cast an actor who feels like they have the gravitas and horsepower to really be that person in real life. And, and Minnie absolutely, I mean, she plays the head of the CIA. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it away here. And I buy her in that role 100%. And what she says tells us a lot about the beekeepers, that maybe there's more going on between the government and the beekeepers than we know, and that we probably shouldn't mess with the beekeepers. I think Jason has an interesting background. Uh, he, you know, was a bit of a street hustler in North London at one point. Uh, you know, you gotta survive, right? Uh, so he understands the world, let's say. And he was a Muay Thai fighter, uh, a kickboxer, a gifted kickboxer, and uh, a diver. He's a very athletic guy. He's kind of done it all. And, and the thing with Jason, he has this incredible physicality, which you just don't see in, in, in a lot of actors. You just, it's, not, it's not a common thing to have a true movie star who is also a, a gifted fighter. In, in the real world, he can go in a boxing gym and hold his own. And, and so he understands um, fighting 
in, in a very experienced way, but just it's, it's, it's truly an honor to work with him because he has such an, an instinctual understanding of what's going to look good on that screen. For audiences, when they go and see this movie, it's really about going to the movies. It's, it's about great acting, great action, cinematic visuals. It's, it's about intricate characters that, that bounce off each other in, in fun ways. It's, it's about being thrilled. It's about being scared for the hero and not being sure if he's going to make it and then he makes it. So I wanted to create a Jason Statham movie where he takes us on not just an action journey, but an emotional journey. I wanted this to be like the, the action movies I grew up on, that when you watch them, there's something really satisfying about how they resolve. You feel like you've watched a movie when those lights come on at the end. I think the idea behind a beekeeper, a beekeeper skill set, is they don't need to run around loaded up with guns uh, you know, like a soldier would. A beekeeper is going to use the environment. A beekeeper is going to sort of sneak in, cause damage, and get away before he knows what happened. A beekeeper can sneak in, cause damage, and, and, and get away before you know what happened. And maybe they'll use a wine bottle. They're going to use anything available in the environment to take out the bad guy and get the mission done. If they, if they need a gun for the task, absolutely. If they got to blow stuff up, they're going to do that. Uh, I think a, a beekeeper is, is a, a virtuoso of violence. When I went and made this movie, I realized how little I knew about bees. And they're pretty fascinating. They, um, how they operate, how they're regimented, um, different kinds of bees, you know, workers, drones, queens. Um, there's bees with specific functions. And in a sense, there are warrior bees that'll go out and fight when there's a threat to the hive. And so a beekeeper understands all of these things. A beekeeper knows how to change the queen if there's a problem with the queen in a hive and preserve the hive. A beekeeper knows how to move a hive. A beekeeper knows how to handle the hive. So it's, and it's interesting because I read some, something that the bees aren't necessarily conscious of a beekeeper when a beekeeper shows up. They don't see the beekeeper. So the beekeeper is almost like this force of nature, this invisible force of organization that is shaping the reality of the bees and the bees aren't aware of that. And it's such a great um, idea to play with uh, the idea of governments and, and who fixes things and, and who has a vision for society and, and how how to help people. So the idea of the beekeepers is that they're really outside of the government. And trust me, if the government could control them and get in there, they absolutely would. And and so a lot of thought went into what what would that look like in the real world and how would it be dealt with? And if you're a government official what would that look like in the real world and how would that be dealt with? And if you're a government official, how do you react to this organization that's running around doing things that you have no control over? And the obvious answer is, well, you keep it all secret and you pretend it doesn't exist. So this is the first time I worked with Jason and it's, you know, you know instantly on set how that's gonna unfold the first day. And I'm watching him and you have all the meetings, you rehearse, and all the discussions, and, and you do all the choreo rehearsals. And, and so we went to set with a great relationship. But until you meet the actor on set, you haven't met the actor. And it, it, it was honestly shocking because he knew the angles. He knows the lenses. He knows the lights. He knows these intricate ways to move, body positioning, how to hold his face. And you can't teach that. That's that's something movie stars have. And you know, you look at old movies, and I study old movies, and there's a stillness and a presence, and just this sophisticated understanding of how cameras work. And when you work with an actor who has that, it's an absolute pleasure because at that point you're capturing magic. Kurt created a world in which you can see its original IP. And you knew that there were potential to juxtapose living in a beehive and living in our society. So he did a great job of you know, creating this world in which everybody could understand because it was able to translate perfectly into our society. Plus the way he built the character, you understood the, the, you know, um, the arc that Jason had to take to heal himself at the same time as finding solace for what happened to his, you know, his uh, 
neighbor. And it was just, um, I don't know, he's just got that little genius, that it factor Kurt does where you read the script and you're like, all right, I've never heard that idea before. That's original. It's, it's a very secret uh, organization which is read into only certain people in government. Um, it has been around for, I think the mythology is 50 years or 60 years is what Jeremy alluded to. It is one of the most important components of our society. They, are, they come in, they remove the chaos, they balance out the hive, and everybody gets to live without knowing they were there. And having one in every state was very interesting because I don't think you can, you can, um, you can squash the chaos geographically if there's only one and you're in California and it's happening in Boston. So geographically speaking, I love the idea of one in each state. I love the fact that they had no rules, but everything they were doing was for the betterment of our society. Yeah, it's Jeremy. I mean, Jeremy and his group. Um, the, uh, what are they, 8711? 8711 guys. And uh, Jason, that was the first call he made when we decided to sign up for the movie. He's like, first person I want is uh, Jeremy Marinus. you got to get him. And I was like, all right, uh, I'll call him up. And Jeremy was, Jeremy's very young, might be 32 years old. Um, done a little second unit directing, but knew he had a little leverage. So he, uh, he said, hey, I'll do it. I'll pass on these other projects, but you guys got to let me second unit direct. And for David, that's kind of like, well, uh, let me see your reel. And he's like, I don't have much of a reel, but call around and ask about me. So it's kind of a leap of faith on our part to take him as a second unit director. But he's fight coordinated for uh, all of the John Wick films. So I knew he was extremely talented the way he's shot theatrically. I mean, David, David's the reason why it, it's not just a normal. The director himself who knows more about angles and lighting and stunts that you can see the difference in David's films and, and you know the other films that aren't as well put together for action. I think the attention to detail that was put together for the fight scenes, I think that um, the enormity of some of the sets, you know, some people probably would have gotten away with just shooting it like a high school musical, um, but he basically had a 360 view of that set that you see in Nine Star. Um, and his just knowledge of uh, camera work and, and obviously his operation. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and comment on the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to be notified when new videos are released.